again. I'd like to welcome everyone who has joined our presentation. I'm sure we'll have a few more joining as we progress. Our subject today is going to be tool shop optimization and how it applies for today's die shop. My name is David Lindemann. I'm a senior application engineer that works for Symmetron Technologies. I've been with Symmetron for the past 10 years. And I'll be the one doing the presentation today. And just a little bit about the company Symmetron. We are a worldwide leader in CAD CAM solutions, but we have been specific in working for the tool and die makers in particular, or discrete manufacturer of parts, mold and die. So we're pretty much in the tooling industry, and our solutions that we write are specifically for tool makers. Symmetron has been at it for over 25 years now, and we have a worldwide presence, as you can see, in some 35 countries with over 20,000 installations. So a little bit about Symmetron. Now, as we go through our presentation today, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them. The way to do that is to send a note. And as you can see by the instructions, send that note to Lisa Sterling, who is our moderator. That's just a right click, and you can send a note. Then we'll be able to go through those questions at the end when uh, we're done. And as you're viewing, you may find that if you hit the Enlarge button, there are like four or five icons on the upper left, hit the Enlarge button and select the option of With Toolbar, and you'll be able to see the full presentation without a cluttered screen. So we encourage you to do that. Our subject today is going to be about concurrent engineering. And we're going to focus on what concurrent engineering is exactly. And to help us understand that, we'll talk about what concurrent engineering is not, as many people have different ideas of what they think concurrent engineering means. But the key is going to be understanding how concurrent engineering very well might be what's most important in improving delivery time. And we'll leave you with the question that you can ask for yourself, is this something that's going to work for my business? So let's start with what we consider the typical die shop process. Uh, we've looked at many of our own customers and others to understand exactly what they're doing. And we're going to look in on the process after the quote has been awarded. Your shop receives the data, and now it's, a, now it's a matter of evaluating the data. Is it something that's usable? Does it match what the data was that was quoted? Is the data in good shape, or do you have to patch it? Do you have to fix it? Usually at that point, the job now goes to either the next available designer or the designer who is the most qualified to handle this job. And then it may go through a series of reviews where engineering managers and tool shop managers meet to decide if this is the correct way to go about doing this tool. It may go back and forth for a while. But once it's finally been approved, from there we'll order the parts, we'll order the steel. The job is then released on into the manufacturing part or to the shop. And we think of that as a throw it over the wall kind of process where the design is done, now everything is handed off to the NC guys, the shop guys, and it's up to them then to build the die. And throwing it over the wall is actually a very fitting analogy because sometimes we find indeed there is a wall there in the process. For one thing, it may involve the translation of data. From there, once it hits the shop floor, there are certain tasks that will need to be performed, such as wire EDMing the punches and the, the clearances and the plates. We may be sending some data to the NC machines for some three-axis milling of the forms. Of course, everything will have to be drilled and tapped. That's another operation. And finally, it's all put together. These different tasks we find oftentimes are receiving their information by different forms of data. It could be a, you know, like a, the NC guys might receive a a CAD file for their three-axis work, whereas others just may receive a print. And we find also that these operations are performed sometimes in entirely different departments working independently of one another. So if asked, where is the job information? Where is all this information we've generated to make it? Where is it? Well, it's all over the place. And to be more specific, we mean by that that if we were to go to the salesman's laptop, we'd find the information that he quoted to probably still sitting there. And looking at the design, we'd find it sitting somewhere on the CAD server. After the job is completed, it's probably zipped up and sitting there in a directory somewhere. The actual NC code, the G code, 
It may be sitting on the controller on the shop floor. Probably it might be sitting on a shop floor workstation if it hasn't been discarded. All the drilling, the wiring routines, again, probably programmed right at the controller themselves if they worked off a blueprint, or for the sake of ease, it's been thrown away, no longer needed. And drawings are probably rolled up somewhere, sitting in a corner at best, they're filed somewhere, and they're sitting off there on their own. So data is everywhere, and so it's fragmented. What does this mean, though, having data scattered or put in different locations? Well, it means in many cases, if we go through an engineering change, a lot of these departments would be starting from scratch. All right? And it's going to be difficult to communicate between departments because we're not all looking at the exact same data. This, of course, lends itself for mistakes. Is the task being completed the same in all the departments as it needs to be? Now, we took some time and we sat down with a, a typical die shop to understand things in a little bit more detail. And we're going to share with you some of the things we found that they were doing. And you might be able to compare the things that uh, you find in your shop to this to see if they're equal. Or maybe it will make you feel better, too, about the way you're doing things now. We found that when we looked closer into the design department, there were many different design softwares that they were using. Uh, what would happen is the job, once it became available, would go to the next available designer who knew a particular software so the job was then translated into that particular software, and they'd go about doing the job. So with all the different designers knowing different softwares, that meant multiple translations all the time to get things through design. From there, the job was then sent on into the NC department, and again, we found multiple NC softwares, particularly that was because of different softwares being used for different machines. Of course, they want to get the most out of the machine, so they're using a particular software. But their NC guys all had different understandings of different softwares. You can see where this would create a backlog on some machines because uh, of the need to program for a specific machine. Even if they wanted to rough the job in one machine and then do the finishing on another NC machine, that would mean the job would have to be sent over to a different software to be programmed for that second machine. So lots of translations were going on to get it through the process. Why did all this come about this way? It's because what we were looking at in this case is what we call an evolved process. It just kind of formed itself this way over time. The shop would go out and buy the latest and greatest new machine, a high-speed three-axis machine. Of course, they want to get the most out of that shop, uh, that uh, new machine, so they buy the new software that goes with it. Usually it's a software that's recommended by the machine vendor. The idea being then that uh, they're going to run that most efficiently. Perhaps they would go and hire a new designer and they want to use his skills right away, but he doesn't know the existing design software, so right away they buy another software so that he can use it. Or it might be that as they grow, they want to take on more functionality, more tasks, so when they look at a solution, they buy the best possible software they could find, the best possible NC software at that time, or the best possible wire EDM software, whatever the case may be. But what the result is is that we're left with many different types of softwares, and none of them talk to one another. They're disparate systems. Now, when we get into dealing with an engineer change, we find that this is a tremendous amount of pain that this shop is going through. They go back through the process where they look to see who is the next available designer that can handle this engineering change, and then the entire job is translated into that software. So it may not be the original designer, but it's this other designer who now is going to pick up where the original designer left off. That immediately means, of course, uh, looking at the data and translating it into different software. Well, days could be lost in getting the data back up to a performable condition. There are patches to fill. There's problems with translations like this. From there, again, it's passed on into the NC department, and there's no saying that it's going to be programmed in the same NC software. But once there, whatever is available, that's what it's programmed into. So entirely new toolpaths are being generated different from what was before. Perhaps the original machine is now tied up, so now it's going to be programmed on a different machine, which means programming it by a different person on a different software. 
after all this is done with all these different translations and data going in different directions, the question now is, is it being transmitted through accurately? Does the design file actually match what's going to take place in being cut on the tool? And that is an issue that was being found by this particular shop. So looking closely at their results, what they found is they're repeating the same thing over and over again, particularly retranslating, starting from scratch with the new software and moving on. That meant that they were losing money on their engineering changes, which is a tremendous factor because so often, as the case in this particular job, the original quote was soft to make it attractive so they could land the work but they figured they'd get the money back by doing these engineering changes. But what they're finding is they're not making the money they thought they were, and instead their de delivery has been delayed. So that brings us to the subject then of concurrent engineering. How does concurrent engineering deal with a situation like what we just looked at or the problems that we've talked about? Oftentimes people have their own idea of what they think concurrent engineering means. Is it a tool that's meant just to respond to urgency, something that you're supposed to do just so you can reach that particular due date? Well, for some it means their thinking is that it's all hands on deck. I'm throwing more engineering resources at the job, so that must mean I'm doing engineering concurrently. And what that really means, though, is they're doing different things to try to get things done quicker to meet the due date. They're making a designer work overtime, perhaps. Uh, maybe they're dedicating more NC machines. They're cutting more parts at one time on different machines so they can get the dye done. In some cases, we'll see a shop oh, take on a second shift, get more workers, more hands on deck to deal with the task. Then there's the ugly word called outsourcing, realizing they're not going to make it in time, realizing their machine capacity is full. They may outsource the work to another shop. Of course, what that really means is you're sharing your profit with another company, a profit you did not intend to share. If you quoted outsourcing originally, it may not be so bad, but now that really hurts. But the process is really still the same process. It's just trying to get the process done quicker. We, st we find we're still throwing data over the wall. There are still parts of the operation that have to wait until the first part is done particularly all the MC and the shop floor applications having to wait until the design is finally finished. And in the end, what we find at the end of the day is that we have increased the cost to finish the job. Then what really is concurrent engineering? Well, it's not meant to be just a crisis management philosophy. What it is is a designed workflow from beginning to end, from quote to delivery, all phases of manufacturing are intended to remain current so that everyone knows exactly where the design is at, how much is available to be worked with, and what the current release level is that everyone is working to. And as an engineering change comes along, concurrent engineering allows the ability to adapt on the fly. So it's not like all things come to a screeching halt and then we wait for one particular department to finish thought is to work smarter and not harder. Begin with, what do we need? Well, it's a different mindset. So we have to look at things differently. We have to think about things differently. And that means being willing to have an open mind to the way we do things. Everybody tends to get into their own comfort level. Things are working fairly well. Things are keeping up. So typically, people don't like to upset the apple cart. Now, of course, that's understandable. But we're finding more and more these blue dates are getting tighter and tighter, and it's getting harder to make the delivery. So perhaps an open-minded view can help us to do that. And one question to ask is, how often do I translate the data, such as the example we looked at? Am I translating multiple times to get the job through the process? And then looking at the process, where are the bottlenecks? What's holding things up? Uh, do I see too much work going to one machine, or is things Taking, are things taking longer to get through design than I would like? And the real question now becomes, in the way I'm using the software, the way it's configured, does it allow for concurrent engineering, or is it actually hindering me? Finally, we'd have to look to at training people on, first of all, having the new mindset involved in concurrent engineering, 
but sometimes it involves uh, looking at people and understanding a need for more skills. Uh, it's not just a matter of reading blueprints anymore, but to understand the process much better and being able to help speed the process along. Everyone plays a vital part in making sure that the due date is delivered, and that's part of the mindset of training that's involved. So let's take a look at an example of concurrent engineering. And we're going to start at the very beginning. We're going to start when the RFQ comes in, because that's the first place that decisions are actually made. That's the first place where the shop is actually touching the data. Of course, a lot of work goes into getting quotes. And sometimes quotes are quoted over and over again before the job actually lands. We find in many cases shops are quoting and getting maybe 1% to 3% of what they actually quote. And more and more are finding that uh, pressure is being put upon them to provide some sort of preliminary strip layout when they deliver the quote. could be just a picture, of course, but it's something that helps the customer be assured that they understand the process that you want to put their metal through. And for that matter, if a strip layout could be done in a few minutes, where it wasn't a time-consuming process and slowing down my quotes, then why not include it if it's going to improve the chance of getting the job? A lot of shops are looking at that in order to uh, get a higher percentage than 1% to 3%. If that's the case, if a preliminary quote is put together, that's something to start with when the design department does their kickoff meeting. They have a much better idea of what's involved in actually designing this tool. In fact, if the data itself could be used and passed on, uh, the design is actually that much further ahead. Sure, it'll need tweaking, but at least uh, the preliminary and the basics are in place. All right, from there, let's look at how that information gets propagated through the design process. And also, let's look at the thought of concurrency right within the design department. We're talking about multiple design processes on the same job. A lot of how this is implemented has to do with how comfortable people are in doing this. And uh, a lot of times they won't try it until they're absolutely desperate and they're running behind. But it is possible to have one designer work on one side of the tool while another designer works on the other. You may look at that and say, well, that's not quite the best way to do it because if you're designing the punch, you're also really designing the die side at the same time. That may very well be the case in a lot of situations. So it could be that the second scenario is more appropriate, where one designer is finalizing the details of the strip, while another designer is beginning the basics of the tool layout. A lot of the tool, like the die set, understanding where the guides are going to be, all those basics could be built up front and while waiting for various components of the strip to fall in place. Perhaps in the strip itself, the actual punch areas are already defined, so those could be worked on while the forming areas, the bends, are being dealt with in the strip design. It's the idea here of concurrent engineering where more than one resource is being thrown at something at a given time because both individuals are able to look at the data, the same data at the same time, both are updated as to what the other one is doing without a concern of overriding or changing that particular task that the other guy is working on. And this allows us to quickly incorporate engineering changes on the fly at any stage in the design. Everybody knows what's going on and can see it. So it's a matter now of bringing the data in, updating the different parts of the strip that are affected and the different components of the tool that are affected without having to start over or, most importantly, without one aspect having to wait for the other one to finish. Then from there, we'll take this process on further into NC and assembly. Here, a concurrent system would allow for the guys in the NC department to know immediately if the design has changed. So they may be concerned, say, with just cutting a particular form station. Well, if the data in the form station has changed, it's not just good enough for them to get an email letting them know that, but that they actually have the system tell them, hey, the data is different. What should we do? Is the option then to rerun all the operations that have been performed already. And by that, I'm looking at the last option where it says to recalculate, not reprogram. In other words, the scheme has been set. We understand how we want to rough it. We understand how we want to finish it. Step overs, down steps, the way the tool is going to move through the steel, all that set is just recalculating it to understand or to have it match what the new geometry looks like. Likewise, the, on the shop floor, 
a blueprint is not going to update automatically just because the design changed in the CAD department. But a shop floor viewer will show a new parts list as things change, and it will also show what the drawing would look like as notifications are made. So it's a matter of keeping the drawing on the computer in a sense, where people can look at the drawing, and the drawing will update as the design changes. How is all this possible? How could it be done? Obviously, one system is needed to carry the data and to do the concurrent engineering. It has to be a system, though, that is designed to do concurrent engineering. That means that design standards are set with each job, and they're saved and carried with each job. That means when I understand the material that I'm using, whatever it is, hot raw hot rolled draw quality steel, whatever it is, the material specs, how it's going to affect the bend conditions, the thickness, that's all saved in with the job. Likewise, the different clearances that we're going to make with the punches could be the factor of 10 or 12 percent that I'm going to use for my clearance. Well, that's saved in with the data. That's part of our setup so that from then on all the punches are going to use the same rule. How do I build my die sets? One die set in one shop could be very different from another. Do I order them from Danley? Do I make them myself? Those standards need to be saved within the system so that they can be drawn on again and again. And that way, too, with standard components, with all the designers using the same standard components, you're ordering from the same place. It's not like each designer now has orders coming from different catalogs, different companies. Plus, everything's the same. That means if I'm using the same component in every design, then the hole for that component is going to be the same. How I cut that component, how I cut the hole, is going to be the same. That means also that the same design standards are available at the very, very beginning, actually during the quotation. The quote can be handled with the same understanding of the material, how it's going to form, how it's going to bend. Likewise, the die, all the components, that information at the quote stage can be understood and used. And everyone's on the same page then. That means the information that's generated with the quote, maybe the preliminary uh, strip, the different forms, even a rough idea of the die set and the quote done in just a few minutes, all that information now can be passed back and forth between quoting and design. Likewise, with quoting and design, NC and assembly are also on the same database. That means if a design changes, NC immediately understands and are told by the system that things have changed. So now when we start talking about great things like NC automation, now it can begin to really make sense and apply. For instance, the thought of being able to drill automatically. You know, if I drill my holes the same all the time, I drill and tap everything the same, teach the system how to do that. Then as the design may change, if a hole moves, if a hole becomes a different type of hole, the system can see it and then apply this new type of, this new cutting procedure to it. In other words, now I'm going to cut the hole the way I would cut that changed hole. All right, so that's uh, something that Symmetron has called auto drill, and that's part of the automation process. Likewise, even with the three axis milling, if we know how we're going to cut that job, now, typically we rough a part the same every time, using the same cutter, same down step, same side step, save that information within the system then apply it as the geometry comes in. Now it becomes a one-click approach. Well, if that geometry were to change, why should things be different? Just reapply it. It's not like you have to set up new strategies and new schemes of how you're going to go about cutting it. Also on the floor with assembly. Immediately assembly uh, understands that there's a design change. That's because they can look at the detailed drawing right on the computer. There it is different. All right, the bill of materials also shows a change. So if there's more components that need to be ordered or if a component's deleted, it's there and it's understood right away. It's instant access to information for taking measurements, for understanding how things go together. All that is invaluable. It's not like they have to wait now for a new blueprint to come out before they can begin the work that they have to do. Well, with all that being said, we focused in on the role that the software plays in concurrent engineering, and we'd like to take a closer look now at the software in particular. Symmetron is, of course, designed to deal with concurrent engineering, so it's the model that we're using. But I don't want to turn this into just a, a demo. OK, 
Okay, we still want to talk about concurrent engineering, and we'll use pictures from screenshots from Symmetron to understand a little better how things work. We want to particularly pay attention to how information is passed on downstream and how it begins to apply from one task to the other. Here we're looking at the material setup in Symmetron. Of course, the database is there for picking the type of material you want, the bend condition that factors in with the material. Here's an example of hot, rock, uh, hot rolled commercial quality. The thickness is typed in. That stays with the job all the way through whatever application would require it, all the different bends, all the different analysis. Likewise, here we set the tool information. I understand where the punch is going to go, okay, or eventually will go, but what will be the clearances around the punch for the stripper plate, for the die plate, uh, for the holder? Also, what type of punch configuration? Do I want it to come straight a distance and relieve off at an angle? Do I want it to start with a sheer edge and relieve off or straight through? The punch type can be defined, and then that will be the same throughout the entire job, unless, of course, I tell it differently on a specific punch. Well, right away, we can begin using the information for establishing the blank. Here's the blank function within Symmetron. You find it's using the exact same material. So I don't have to worry about it being right or not every time I push the button to blank it. And this is a fairly involved little part. You've got some up and down turns over a non-uniform face or series of faces. The blank can then be used later on to, for the quote, for knowing the perimeter, the whole XY area, or also used in nesting. Material information also helps understand the formability. Of course, immediately you can see where this is invaluable during a quote stage. Can I actually hit this in one strike, or will it take multiple strikes? Will I tear somewhere? If I change the material thickness or the material type, make it a harder material, will it now be unbendable? All that information is important as we quote it. But that's information also that applies to understanding how I'm going to lay the strip out. So it's information that can be used by design. That same material information also is used then with the different unbending operations. Uh, here we've picked a fairly involved unbend in that it's being unbent to a non-uniform, non-planar, non-conical face or series of faces. So actually that green area with the blue dot, that's following the same topology of the series of irregular faces you see there, or we might call it a, a binder in some cases. But what's important is it's consistently using the same material throughout. Now that applies also even, even on the more simple linear bends that may take place, 90 degree bend, bend, as well as a bend to a plane, a bend to a surface. There are numerous uh, bending types. Perhaps you can see on the right hand side of the screen, oh, there must be one, two, three, four. There must be about a good six, seven different operations you can perform for different types of bends to do the flattening. Of course, they all, again, importantly, use the same material specs. All right, once the perimeter is established, like we talked about, that information now can be used in nesting. So here's the, the nesting feature where one or two rows could be established and putting out the information for the type of uh, tooling we're going to be building. Here it's important that the margins are set, and also somewhat in the middle of the screen, you, you can see the progression here is set to six and a half inches. Well, once that is set, why do I have to think about it? When I start punching things, when I start laying things out, progression is almost always, very rare exception, is going to be different. It's going to be the same. So use that information. Propagate that through the system in the places where I would need to use it. Also of note, if you are interested to have a quote guy, you can see in the grayed out that we're keeping track of the scrap area and the blank area. That, again, is vital information calculated here that could be used to help speed along the quote process. Here's an example of what I mean. Propagate that information of the progression through the system. I'm just doing a simple punch. Basically, we pick where the punch is going to start, and then you can see it repeated downstream through the strip. It carries its way through. All right, and that's through the same when it comes to nesting, when it comes to all the different punch forms. All that is established and used again and again. So again, knowledge is being propagated through the system as things are built. Here's an example of a completed strip. Now I focus on this particular thing, not just to talk about, yeah, Symmetron could do a strip, okay? But you see the green colored areas. You see the purple colored areas. Here is where the information from the strip, 
or the decisions, the knowledge gained when designing the strip is now passed into the tool design. That green area is my punch. That's where I want the punch to go, the punch plate, the uh, stripper plate. All that information is linked to that green surface. Likewise with the form. One of the forms is going to be created from the purple area. Well, the information's there on that particular part of the strip. Let's use it when we're building the form. All right, that's the idea behind, again, concurrent engineering, using what you have and working through, not redoing things, not guessing. Now, by that, like looking again at the green area, well, getting ahead of myself here. Uh, we talked a bit about the die set. We talked about grabbing the shop standards and using them again and again. Uh, that can be used here in the die set. All right, this is the type of guide I use. This is the type of bushing I use. Uh, this is the rule I use, how far I set it from the corner. When my plate gets this big, this is how big my bushing gets. Those are the rules that are grabbed and then put into the die set. This is a fairly hefty die set. You know, I'm actually loading some 300 components when we work with this particular die set. So it could be as complicated or as simple as you'd want it to be. It's got stripper plates. It's got die plates punch forms, everything all lined up, springs, screws, everything is attached. Now an example you see in the catalog there on the left hand side, it's a progressive die set, but this could just as easily be for a transfer die, it could be for a single station die, it could have a few components, it could have many components. It's a matter of understanding the way you work and then incorporating that. That means too that as the job gets bigger or smaller, this is sized, it's resized, it's made bigger to match a bigger strip, it's made smaller to match the smaller strip. What's important is that the standards are the same. All right, and that goes the same too for any component within Symmetron, or any component that we're going to use in concurrent engineering. It should have the ability to bring in more than one part at a time. If I'm using a die insert like this, it should be an assembly. Now, why do I have to bring in two, three plates, screw them all together, dowel them down, make all those multiple operations when it's going to be the same every time, or roughly the same. So here's an idea behind capturing, again, the standards intended for doing the type of insert work. And this could be custom. It doesn't have to be generic or the way it's dictated to you by the particular software. It should be the way you do things. Now you see that green surface? You can see how the green surface is being used to actually make the particular punch unit Here's what that looks like. This is the dedicated punch creation tool. Basically, you pick that green surface. You tell it to go all the way to the backup plate. You tell it how far to push down past the steel of the strip into the die insert, and we apply the rules now. Uh, we told it how much offset we wanted when it gets through the die insert. We told it the angle to relieve it. it. All that information is applied by picking that one green surface. It propagates through the entire die set area. From that, of course, the bill of materials has to constantly update. So as I add components, as I take away components, it's an ongoing, active document. It's always there. It's always active. That applies whether I'm looking at it here on a spreadsheet or whether it's been attached to a drawing. It should update. The drawing updates when the part changes or when the die set changes, the BOM updates. That's key to keeping everybody current. So now you can see how we're talking about taking information from the very beginning and how that information propagates all the way through the system. Even down here at the level of assembling it, we understand things are constantly updating so that everyone is looking at the same database and is current. That should apply also with NC like we talked about. Here's just an example of a rough NC cutter path. What's important is that it always sees the current design. So if that geometry changes, a red flag pops up on the screen that says the geometry has changed, should we recalculate the cutter path? The answer may be no. Uh, so if, the, if it's an engineering change where I'm actually going to cut further into the form, you know, then why not use what I have, if, especially if I've already cut it? The right. thing is, though, is understanding what's been cut and what has not been cut in that particular case. All right. With that, we're talking about what we call stock recognition. All right, if this is what I've cut, I need to know that's where I'm starting at. Then when I incorporate the engineering change, I know now there's a wallowed area that's going to have a lot more stock in it, and that's where I need to incorporate another rough cut. So the thought of intelligence in an NC package 
has to understand these changes as they occur so that the stock can update and now the new cutter path is going to focus in on just the area that's behind. It's not a matter of me windowing it in and guessing and hoping I've got it right and, and if I missed an area, now my finish tool goes into a heavy area and breaks. That's not the matter anymore because now the software is to understand where those areas are at. Uh, likewise, uh, maybe it's um, a situation where, well, if I know I'm going to be roughing out more of this, this stock now, why not apply the roughing procedures that I've already used? I apply it through a template. It knows where the stock is at. I tell it this is the tool I want it to use. This is the way I rough. And within a click now, it goes after that remaining material. So that's the idea how information propagates through and immediately the engineering change affects the way things are being handled in all the different departments, including um, the wire department and also the drilling department. Here's an example when we talked about automatic drilling before. Basically, it identifies the different holes. It sees holes that have pockets on top of them. It sees holes that need to be counterboard, drilled through the holes, line holes, tapped holes. And then I define the way I like to do it. This, this is always the drill I use when I'm drilling and reaming in quarter 20 tapped hole, or drilling and tapping a quarter 20 tapped hole. That's the saved in the system that's applied again and again and again. So after a while, once the system is taught how to drill and tap, it automatically will do it by identifying the whole size and the whole shape. So if this changes, the operation is rerun. I understand the ones that have been drilled and the ones that may be new that need to be drilled or the ones that have changed and need to be redrilled, now the system attacks just those new holes, and those are the ones I apply a drill sequence to. So that's quite a bit of information we've thrown at you. We're trying to keep this on the idea of how concurrent engineering really can affect delivery when it comes to dye production. Uh, just a few comments that you can read from some of our customers talking about how they desired things to be more effective and improve the process that they were dealing with and they wanted to look at automation, but they understood that uh, there were some things they needed to do in order to get that level that they were looking at. Here's another one. And this, uh, a lot of this has been done by people who have spent a lot of time looking at different softwares, and they had a goal in mind. And they wanted to see their process improve, and this is what they used. So we're going to pass some of that information that they've really given to us by their process on to you, and hopefully you found this to be interesting and informative. So the question is, as we look at this, applying concurrent engineering to the die design can really help, it can increase productivity and also shorten delivery time. Importantly, it makes you more responsive to the changes that come about with customer data, and that's going to help your bottom line. The question is then, is it something for you? Can you make concurrent engineering something successful at your shop? Is that something that interests you? So with that, we'll take a look at some questions, should you have any. I'm going to toggle over and see now uh, if we've uh, got any questions so far, and I'll be looking at them here on my screen. Questions. If you have any questions yourself, uh, go ahead and pass them in now. Uh, also, uh, we'll bring up at the end uh, an email address that you can use and how you can contact us. One question is, we talked about shop for floor viewers. Can you explain what it is and how it works? The idea of a shop floor viewer, a lot of places are they're generating a print, sending it out, and that's how things are being assembled is by looking at the print. And that's how things have been done for years. The thought of a shop floor viewer is to put a seat of the software out on the floor where basically all they can do is look at it and take measurements. So they can generate a, a drawing, uh, put a view on it, take some measurements, put some dimensions on it, and use that instead of something like a blueprint. Of course, you can see how important that is if the design keeps changing. You want to make sure that the holes that are being drilled or the way they're, the components they're ordering, all that information is current to what the design is. So the shop floor is basically a viewer package out there on the shop floor that everyone can access. You can't save, you can't change the data, but you can access it and look at it. Does Symmetron allow the use of commercial catalog products? Yes. In fact, with the system, 
film catalogs uh, from well-known vendors like Dayton, um, Danley. There's a few others in there, too. There's quite an extensive list of different catalogs as well, and those catalogs are always being updated. We're adding more catalogs to the system at all times. So that's something that we get a lot of feedback from our customers on the catalogs they need. Now, as well as that, you can also use your own catalogs. You can make your catalog that has all the functionality of any catalog that's already there with the system. It has the knowledge of the component. The component can be ordered and the size can be changed. And it knows the hole that it sits in. So when you place the component, the hole is automatically placed with it. And that includes even assemblies. So when you saw me play that die insert set in, uh, when I placed it, it would have cleared the pocket for it. It would have put and drilled the tapped holes in. It would have put the reamed holes in. So all that information can be brought together then in working with the catalog. How can we get help implementing a current engineering process? So talking about uh, processing changes. Uh, you certainly can contact us and we can talk about concurrent engineering and what it means. In fact, if you have any questions or if you have any interest in looking further at the product, please contact us. Again, we'll flash that email at the end uh, so that you can get more information and uh, we can arrange to meet with you, have a demo, perhaps even look at the jobs you're doing and the process you're doing and how things can work. Uh, we've done things where we've gone into shops and we have looked at the entire process, interviewed people, gotten to know exactly how the workflow is moved. That way we can identify potential bottleneck areas where things are slowing things down. Then we can recommend a process you know, based upon what you're doing. Now, whether you choose to look at Symmetron or not, that's something that we call tool shop optimization. And that's something that a lot of people have benefited from. Uh, is there any other questions that anyone may have. Uh, again, you can simply right-click on uh, Lee Erling or moderator and then send a question in. Okay, I'm not seeing very many more questions, so let me flash this on the screen. I'd like to thank everyone for being here and attending this event. You can contact us further at info at .com. You can reach us by calling 248-596-9700, or please feel free to visit our website, symmetrontech.com. We'd be happy to hear from you, and if you have any further comments, uh, please contact us. So again, thank you for attending our event.